Let's look at Luke chapter 1 this morning as we continue our Comfort of Christmas series. We're talking about how do we experience the true comfort of Christmas. And as we come to Luke chapter 1, we come in contact with one of the most known and memorable figures in the Christmas story, the young woman named Mary. And oftentimes the church hasn't known what to do with Mary. She's definitely uh, perhaps the most venerated woman in history. I did a quick Google search to confirm my suspicions that over the past 100 years, the most common name given to a girl on earth is Mary. I think it should be Stephanie because that's my wife's name, but it was Mary. And, you know, people have had all kinds of different thoughts about Mary. Many of them are extra biblical, like, well, Mary was sinless. She was the one human that, that never sinned. Or some people, I've, I've gone into some churches in different parts of the world where instead of in the center, Jesus on the cross, it's Mary. Some people treat Mary like she's part of the divinity, the Father, the Son, and Mary. So I want to look at this word today because I actually believe that Mary is a model for us in how she related to God. So let's jump in in verse 26. It says this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we should immediately say, huh, this is interesting because Nazareth is a no-name town. It wouldn't be like San Diego or Los Angeles. It would be like one of the little roads you come in on the 8 freeway or probably even off the 8 freeway. But you might just stop to get gasoline, probably not a stoplight, just a, a, a very nondescript, tiny, tiny village. The angel comes to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Joseph was a simple carpenter of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mary. Make sure you're listening. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is in the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Underline that verse. That's where we're going to zero in. Chapter 1, verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel said, departed from her. I want to zero in on how Mary responded to the Lord because I believe she's actually a model on how we as ordinary, often feeling weak, often feeling inconsequential humans can actually be used by God to bring forth his kingdom in our generation. Now let me be sure to tell you that what Mary experienced and what happened to her will never happen again. An angel of the Lord coming to proclaim that she was actually going to carry the Son of God in her womb, that will only happen once. However, the way in which God related to her and the way in which she chose to hold on to that word, to receive the word of God and believe the word of God led to an incredible advancing of the kingdom. And that's what I want to zero in on. In order to do that today, I want to give you a Greek word study, uh, a lesson in Greek. Now, why would I do that? The Bible is written in languages that aren't English. Do you know that when the Bible was, was first penned, it wasn't written in the English language. It was written the Old Testament, the Bible for you that are new, uh, for you that are new to the Bible. The Old Testament is the first half, and it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The second part, the New Testament, is written in Greek. And sometimes it really helps us to dive into the original languages because they're actually pregnant with meaning. Uh, no pun intended, since we're talking about 
the Virgin Mary. All right. So um, Merry Christmas to me. My team knows how much I love to ride on whiteboards, and they say, Robert, we can't ever read it when you're doing that. So we got a digital whiteboard, so I am really thrilled. And I'm going to give you a Greek lesson today on this whiteboard. So, whoa, quick tip. It said something about fatigue, but I'm not tired yet. All right. This is verse 37. For nothing shall be impossible with God is what it said in the translation I read. For nothing shall be impossible with God. I mean, very encouraging verse. But I want to unpack this for you in the Greek because we're going to unveil some powerful meaning that you're going to be able to grab hold of, and it's going to release some faith in your heart. So let's go through this Greek lesson. And the reason I'm going to actually write this out is because my mom is watching, and she spent thousands of dollars for me to take Greek in college. All right. The first word, OT. First word, OT, right, means, means for. Well, there's nothing especially exciting about that. That's what it said in our English translation. Ook means no. Well, that's, that's pretty common too. But we skip to what the actual subject is, and we come down to this word. This word is rhema. Rhema. That means word. Rhema means word. And so what we're seeing is for no word. And then we come here, para to theo means from, and theo means God. So no word from God, but here is where you get something really cool. You get this word, adunatesai. What does that mean? It comes from the root word dynamite. Dynamite. Think about the power of loading in dynamite and boom, an explosion. It can absolutely obliterate rock and just by force create something new. For no word from God, adunatesai, this would be power, but you put the ah in front of it, it puts a negative. And so what it means is no word from God is without power. No Rama word is without power. Now, this has profound impact on us. You think, well, you know, Robert, what, what is this saying? What, I, what I'm wanting for you to understand is today you can have comfort this Christmas time through God's word to you because when God gives you a word, it has power to fulfill God's will for your life. Now, before I go into Rhema, I need to take you into another Greek lesson, which is there's two words for word in the Bible, and the other is logos. And logos, more common, more understood. I grew up in church, and we talked about the logos word a lot. Logos means the written word of God. It's this right here. Don't you love the written word of God? I said, don't you love the written word of God, church? Oh, man, if you don't, I'm not doing my job as a pastor because I love this word. And we need the word of God. I was meeting with our school of transformation and doing a little question answer. And, and a couple of the students asked, how do you not just have your mind spin all the time? Like, how do you just stop from thinking all the time? How, how can you find peace of mind? Well, here's the answer the word of God. I'm going to spend most of the sermon talking about the rhema word of God. I'll go back to that in a minute, but let me just talk about the logos word of God. The Bible says this. I, I love this scripture. Great peace have those who love your law. The law of God is another word for the word of God. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. What I know is in 2020, so many people have not had peace. We said around the time of the elections that over 50% of American studies showed could have been diagnosed with actual anxiety disorder. But do you know that the Bible says that if you love his word, you can have great peace. It will actually cause you not to stumble. One of the things I, I think that people love about me, especially as a pastor, one of the things I think people love when they walk up to me after church is that I shower regularly. I do it for me. 
but I also do it for you. I'm a clean pastor. I spend a lot of time outside. I spend a lot of time working outside. I'm an outdoors guy. I spend a lot of time working out in the gym. And when I do that, I began to have an odiferous uh, aroma. Uh, I, I don't want to just have the sweet swell- smelling fragrance of Christ emitting from me. I also want to smell like soap and, and deodorant. And, and therefore, I shower. Uh, why do I say that? I say that because when you shower, when you, when you are washed with the word, you become clean. Ephesians 5 says this, by the washing of the word. When we do not wash our minds with the word, they begin to smell as we are exposed to the patterns of this world. But Romans 12 says this, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know that when your mind is just in the world, this is why I plead with you as a pastor, please start every day with a shower, a word shower, because your mind needs to be washed and renewed. Here's one of the reasons why I plead with you, please spend more time reading the good news than just the news. Right now, I'm not against the news. I'm thankful for the news, and I check numerous sources a day, but I make sure that every day I study the Bible more than I study what news outlets say, because a lot of times that's discouraging, but when I read this, it's encouraging. This is the good news, and I encourage you more than any news outlet, make sure you're studying the Bible, because what we know for certain is this is true. I want to challenge you to read the Bible even more than social media. Do you know that everything you read on social media is not true? But do you know that God can't lie? This book can't lie. This is the firm foundation to bank your life upon. How can you have a mind of peace? Love the word of God. Read the word of God. It's a light into your feet. It's a lamp to your path. The word of God is a firm foundation that you can anchor your life in. I implore you, every day, spend time in the word of God. It will anchor you. It will cement you. It will purify you. It will wash you, and it will give you great peace peace. You need the word of God. That is the logos word, but I also love the rhema word. The rhema word, as one theologian says, is the spoken word of God to an individual concerning God's will. The spoken word of God to an individual concerning God's will, that's what was spoken to Mary, the spoken word of God of something that would happen in her life. Now, so oftentimes what we think, well, that was just in the Bible. No, this is a promise from Jesus that if you are his follower, you will hear his spoken word. John 8, 47 says this, he whoever belongs to God hears what he says. Whoever belongs to God, here's what he says. It's a promise to you that if you belong to God, you can hear what he says. It's the model of Jesus. Jesus told his followers, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They listen to my voice and they follow me. He said, this is how I actually live my life. Jesus said this in John 5, 19, when he's trying to explain how he did a miracle, he says actually this, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. What he's explaining is that there's this language, there's a spiritual language that you will hear or that you will see. And Jesus said, I don't just go out and do things on my own will. And you're like, what? But you're the son of God. Of course you do. Jesus said, no, everything I do, I'm in perfect union with the father and he speaks it, he shows it to me, and then I go out and act, how much more should we as his sheep? How much more should we as his children? And so then this is the model that we see in the New Testament. The book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. We're going to track through this. Acts 8, 29 through 30. There's this ordinary guy named Philip. He becomes a deacon and and he is out and, and all of a sudden he sees this Ethiopian ruler and He hears the Spirit. Listen to what the Spirit says. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot 
and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? So Philip, as a Jew, he wouldn't have interacted with an Ethiopian. He certainly wouldn't have thought this Ethiopian was seeking God. But the Spirit speaks to him, hey, this is a person who's seeking out the Hebrew God. He's actually reading from your scriptures. He runs over there. He asks the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? He goes, no, how can I? Philip explains it to him, and the guy gives his life to Jesus. You see, the Spirit wants to lead us to be a blessing to the world. Look at Chapter 10, verse 19 and 20 of Acts says, While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. We see here that the Spirit actually helps us understand the events of our life. In life, when I'm talking to someone, I want to have one ear listening to them and one ear listening to the Spirit so I can help them with what God would give them. In life, I want to have one eye on the natural circumstances and one eye on heaven so I can understand what is God doing in each event. This is the normal spirit-led life of a believer. Acts 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, so they're in this church gathering, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. That's why we love to be a praying church. That's why we call fast. That's why we have weekends like the Commission Weekend, so people can come and have specific times where we're gathered together and we have faith for God to release his callings. And perhaps you're not fulfilled in what you're doing right now in life. I want to say maybe it's because you haven't actually gotten a calling from the Lord. God wants to call his people in all kinds of vocations. He wants to call his people into all types of places. He wants to call us to use all kinds of giftings, but we need to hear the Lord so that we can advance his purposes in the God-given purpose that he has for you. You need the rhema word. You need the rhema word. You say, well, what's an example of the rhema word impacting us? Well, I want to say today you're experiencing the result of a rhema word. Like you are living out the fruit of a rhema word today. You might ask how? By being at all people's church. Do you know this church, why, why did this church start? My, my wife and I have tried to bank everything on hearing the Lord and obeying. We were pastors in Texas, and we had been asked, would you take this job for 10 more years? And so we said, well, we'd love to, but let's ask the Lord. And so I'm down on my knees in my bedroom in Texas, and I ask the Lord, God, what have you called me to? Because I want to just do exactly what you're calling me to. And he said, I've called you to church planting. I've called you to San Diego, California in two years. Uh, I've told you many times when God said San Diego, California, I didn't know where San Diego was. God might speak things that you don't know or that you don't understand. I didn't know if it was, you know, the bread basket, like by Bakersfield. I didn't know if it was up by San Jose. I got up and looked at my globe, and I was super excited that it was on the ocean and near Mexico. I love the ocean. I love Mexican food. I, but God was speaking that to us, and God spoke two years. Can I tell you, in almost exactly two years, we were here launching All People's Church. And you say, well, why is it named All People's Church? Well, that's an interesting name. That's what I thought. But about two weeks after we received the word to move to San Diego, I was praying one day saying, well, God, if you're calling us to plant a church, what's the name going to be? And as clear as day, I get the word All People's Church. I actually went downstairs to where Steph was, and I said, Steph, can you call a church All People's Church? She said, well, that's a little interesting name. Well, the crazy thing is I started seeing it everywhere in the Bible, starting in the book of Genesis where God tells Abraham, and you'll be a blessing to all peoples. I started seeing it where God said, and you'll be a house of prayer for all peoples. Look through the Bible. It's everywhere. I just had never seen it before, but God knows what's in the book. And he was speaking it to me. That's why you're sitting in a church in San Diego called All People's Church. But some of us go, well, yeah, of course, you're a pastor. You're going to hear God, and that's a church. Of course, God would speak something about something like a church. But what about just ordinary life? Can I tell you, God wants to be intimately involved in your everyday life. Here's something that many of you will relate to. Where you live. When Stephanie and I got married, so we were about to start a family, we started praying, God, where would you have us live? 
And God spoke very clearly to move to the inner city. Now, is that what I would have chosen? No, I grew up on a little ranch. I love open spaces, but I hear and I obey. That is the key to to hearing God is you've got to say, Lord, I want to obey you. And then he showed me this 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 little corner lot on Sanger Avenue, about a block from where we were, we were building our, our church back then. And, uh, and as I'd pray about this, it was an empty lot. I could see this two-story white siding house. I could just see like a, an impression of it in my mind, even though it didn't exist there. And so I knew, you know, I need to buy this piece of land in the inner city and build a home. Like I would have never thought of doing that. That wasn't my desire But that's what God's leading me to do. So what do I do? I I hunt down the owner of the land. He lived in a different city. And I called him because I want to obey that word of the Lord. And I called this man. His name was Joe. And I said, Joe, I want to buy your piece of land. And I offered even more than the lots were going for around, right? I wanted to give a fair offer and actually be a blessing. So do you know what Joe said? He said, no way. I'm offended by your offer. Can I tell you, just because you receive a word from the Lord doesn't mean it's going to be easy. (laughs) Just because you receive a word from the Lord doesn't mean it's going to be easy and doesn't mean that every door is going to open right in front of you. I'm serious, because sometimes people, they get a word from the Lord, and then things don't, the dominoes just don't start falling. They're like, well, I guess God's not leaving me. I'm just going to go do what I think I should do. So what do you do? Well, we call Joe the next month, and guess what? He doesn't answer the phone. And so I call him month three, month four, month five. The guy won't answer the phone. He won't take my phone calls. Month six, I'm still calling. Why? Because if you have a word from the Lord, it has power to fulfill God's will for your life. Month seven, I call. Still no answer. I'm getting a little frustrated, and my faith is wavering. And I have a dream. I have this dream, and in this dream, I'm standing on this piece of land. And uh, uh, an old pickup truck pulls up next to the land, and a real gruff guy with, with a, a, a blue jean shirt with the sleeves ripped off and it all frayed looks at me and says, get in the truck. And I knew in the dream that it was safe to get in the truck, so I get in the, in the truck, and he goes, "My name," in a gruff voice, my name's Agabus, and you're going to get this land, and it's going to be called Gaul. So what do I do? I wake up and I write down the dream. Let me, let me just walk you through some best practices for receiving and interpreting dreams from the Lord. If you've ever felt like you had a spiritual dream, would you just raise your hand? You ever felt like you had a spiritual dream? Like, I mean, look at the amount of hands. This is one of the, the ways that God speaks to his people. Joel 2, Acts 2 as well, says that You will dream dreams in the last days. It's a way that God speaks. Look at the book of Daniel. Look at the end of Genesis with Joseph. God gives dreams to help people understand what's going to happen. So let me give you some best practices. Number one, when you get a dream, write it down. When you get a dream, write it down. I hope you're writing this down so you can remember to write it down. Write it down. Here's why. Uh, The Bible says he who is faithful and little will be ruler over much. If you want God to speak to you, then make sure you savor what he's speaking. Make sure you actually log what he's speaking. Make sure you write down what he's speaking. So for years, I kept a a journal next to my bed so that if I had a dream, I'd write it down. Now I don't need to do that because I keep things uh, digitally. So I just open up a note on my phone and I say dream and I put down the date and I make sure if I wake up in the middle of the night after a dream, I write it down then. I don't wait till the morning because so many times they're gone. So I, I wake myself up and I write them down. Number two, secondly, ask God to reveal the interpretation. Uh, God is the great dream interpreter. Look at the book of Daniel. Look at how God gave Joseph dream interpretations. Throughout Scripture, God gives interpretations. So what I do is I write it down the next morning in my own time with God, in my own what I call FaceTime, I start asking the Lord, so God, what are you saying? And God will so often start speaking to me what the interpretation is. And a big part of that is number three, start comparing the imagery to the Bible. So, so many times, you know, uh, because this is what could happen. You have a dream where you're like, uh, you're, you're, you're going super fast 
in a car, and you're like, oh, that must mean I need to go out and buy a Ferrari. And God's like, no, moving very fast in a mode of transportation meant something else, maybe an acceleration in your life. So we actually look at the imagery in Scripture. And so I'm I'm continually studying that. And then number four, go and talk to a a wise mentor who's well-schooled in the Bible or or perhaps someone who has a a gift of interpretation. We have a prophetic team. And so oftentimes people are asking different members of our prophetic team to help them interpret. So that is what I did. I did all of these things. And I remember uh, taking the next day that dream and sharing it with my, my pastor to get his understanding. And I said, you know, I had this dream. I'm standing on a piece of land. And he goes, well, I think that you standing on that piece of land symbolizes the piece of land. Oh, thank you. And, and then I, I already knew. I said, well, that's really cool. You know, this guy drives up in a truck. His name is Agabus, strange name, but I had already looked it up in the Bible. And Agabus in the Bible was a New Testament prophet. He's actually the one who comes to Paul and, and, and puts his hands together, binds his hands together and says, this is what's going to happen when you go to Jerusalem. So I knew, wow, this is so cool. This New Testament prophet is showing up in my dream. But then what happened next? He said, you're going to get this land. And my pastor looks at me and goes, what I believe the interpretation of you're going to get this land means is you're going to get this land. Awesome. And I, I mean, that was really encouraging to me because remember, seven months I'd been chasing after it. And he said, But Robert, if you remember, gall in the Bible is what Jesus was given on a sponge to drink, that bitter mix uh, that he was given to drink on the cross. And so I believe this journey is going to be marked with suffering. I went, Oh, but it already had been. So guess what? I call again, and nothing happens. Month eight, I called again, nothing. Month nine, no answer. Month 10, no answer. Month 11, just because you have a word from the Lord, just because you have a dream from the Lord does not mean it's going to be easy. In fact, sometimes the clearer the word, the more you need it. Did you hear me? Sometimes the more clear God is speaking, the more you need it because of how challenging the circumstances will be. Month 10, no word. Month 11, no word. I'm getting very frustrated, very challenged again. And I finally call month 12, and Joe answers the phone and says, Robert, how you doing? (laughs) Now, you got to understand, for 12 months, I had been praying for Joe every single day. I had been praying, God, get his heart. God, soften his heart. And God, give me the land. Every day, that thing. God, get his heart and give me the land. Every single day. He goes, Robert, how are you doing? I said, well, uh, 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 Joe, I'm calling again to offer to buy your piece of land. He goes, I've had a change of heart. That was his phrase. I, I, I was taken back. I said, really? He goes, yes, I just had quadruple bypass surgery. I almost died of a heart condition. I went, God, I didn't mean get his heart like that. I meant like, and he said, no, but God, God has changed my heart. He goes, and and he ends up telling me, he's like, I was a real, you know, he said, romp. And and he goes, he goes, I want to live for God. And he goes, you're a pastor. I want to give you this land. I know you want to use it to bless God and to bless people. I sit down and meet with him. Steph and I meet with he and his wife, and his wife goes, he has changed. He, she, she looks at him, and she goes, he has changed. You know, God was using the process to transform a guy in, in the process to bring him joy and peace. He ends up selling us the land at a great price, and to this day is a beautiful house, a two-story white-sided house where God is still touching and, and moving and meeting people. You know, the Bible says this. It says that nothing's impossible with God, but I I love that translation that the NIV translates Luke 1, 37, for no word from God will ever fail. Did you hear me? That no word from God will ever fail. And sometimes you have someone standing in the way, and you're like, 
I know I was called into this, this place, and I, I know I want to do good, but my boss is opposing me, and they're so harsh, or, or this coworker, they're just out to get me, or, or, or this, this person, they're just persecuting me. Like, all I want to do is help people. All I want to do is extend the kingdom, and there are people just coming against us. Can I tell you that no word from God will ever fail? Listen to what Scripture says. It says, as the rain, this is Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. It's basically saying, just as like rain or snow comes down and it changes things and it actually brings about new life. Look at the next part. It says this. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it today. I want to tell you, you can have comfort when God gives you a word because that word has power to accomplish God's will. And you might be saying, wait, 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 wait. No, no, I thought God had the power to accomplish his will. Well, of course he does. But God works through his word. And God's words are different than ours. And God's word actually has power to accomplish his will. He gives you a word and in it is dynamite power to accomplish his will. All you have to do is step out of this tent and look up at the sky and you will see a massive ball of flaming fire that if our planet got any closer, we would all be incinerated and from it is emitting tremendous light and you have to understand, how did that get created? By God's word. How did God create the sun, the lights, the stars, the millions of stars? He said, let there be light. And boom, it happened. God's word is the most powerful thing in the universe. You can bank your life on it. Bank your life on the Logos word. But get the rhema word for God in your circumstances and you will see his kingdom prevail. All over this tent are people that are in all kinds of challenges. You're in challenges in your workplace. You think you could, you could never thrive. There's financial challenges. Like you're looking at your bank account and you're going, there's no way I'm going to make it or I'm in a deep hole of debt. I'll never get out. Or you're in a marriage that is completely painful or your body is stricken with some kind of sickness. Or you're in a relationship with siblings or family members that's totally contentious and painful and harmful. And you're looking and saying, how could I ever make it? No, what you need to do is go to God and get a word from God because his word does not fail. This is what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You need to go get God's plan because God's plan is not to harm you. God's plan is for hope. God's plan is for a future. And so you get God's plan. How do you get God's plan? You actually go and seek it, Jeremiah 33. It says this, call to me and I will answer you. When you start getting in a trial, when you're in a challenge in your workplace, when you're in a broken place in your marriage or your family, when you're being opposed by people who do not want you to prosper, when you find yourself stricken with an illness, when you find yourselves in all kinds of challenges, what do you do? Go call on the name of the Lord. Go call on God and wait for him because he says this, call to me and I will answer you. We have to learn to wait for the answer. God will speak to you. He's a God who speaks. So many of us grew up just going, okay, I need to pray. And we just say a bunch of words. Oh, God, will you do this? Oh, God, will you do that? Oh, God, will you help me this? But we never stop to listen. But he says, call to me, and I will answer you. And he goes on to say this, and tell you, and tell you great and unsearchable things, things that you do not know. Now, I need to tell you this. They might not be things that you like. God told Moses, Moses, you need to go back 
into Egypt. You need to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses didn't want to do it. He's like, no, God, I can't speak well. I'm just out here with some sheep. Do you know that I killed someone back there? Like, this is not good. But do you know when he obeyed and he followed God, he saw the glory of God in his generation. Elijah, he's told to go and confront Rahab and, and, and Jezebel who was destroying the people of God. And Elijah's like, no, I don't want to do it. No, please, no. But do you know when he obeyed God, he saw the fire of God fall. He saw nature controlled by the Lord. He saw the glory of God in his generation. Here's a good one. You know that Jesus, when God spoke to him, he didn't want to do what God was telling him to do. Garden of Gethsemane. He's like, oh, Lord, if there's any way, please let this cup pass over me. He didn't want to go to the cross, but by him obeying the Lord, he took our sins on the cross. He defeated the power of sin and death. God rose him from the dead, and he made him the Savior of all mankind, and he saw the glory of God, not just in his generation, but every generation. Hallelujah. You might not like what God tells you to do, but can I tell you, it's a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. It is his best plan, and you will see the glory of God in your generation if you get that word, you receive the word, and you believe the word. Now, I want to give you just a a, a few helpful pastoral tips. I want to call them hearing God etiquette. Because some people just get really weird in this hearing God thing. I think that's why a lot of churches don't hear. Uh, they don't teach hearing God. They, don't, they, they teach about the Logos word, but not the Rhema word. Right? Because pe- people, people just do some weird things in the name of God. Right? Have you noticed that before? They say some weird things. They, so I, 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 I want to walk you through some hearing God etiquette to finish our time here. Number one, the bigger the word, the more drastic the life change the more we need confirmation. You're sitting there one day, spending time with God, and all of a sudden you get this thought, I'm supposed to run for the President of the United States. That might just be the pizza talking to you, folks. (laughs) Right? Uh, the, The bigger the word, the more we need confirmation. That's why I encourage you, when you're making a big life decision, you're gonna make a move. With your life, you're going to make a career change. Ask God for confirmation. He is okay with that. I love the story of Gideon where he actually put out fleeces. I remember when God spoke to us to move to San Diego. We were in the middle of our job. We owned our home. And and man, I want to do anything God says. But here's what I know about God is God is a God who confirms his word. So we did a 30-day journal. Do you know that at the end of that 30 days, I had 22 clear confirmations to move to San Diego, California. Ask God for confirmations, and the main place you confirm it is in his word, right? God will not contradict the Bible. And I've heard, I've had all kinds of people tell me weird things that they feel God spoke to them, but they're not in the Bible, and so I know that's not from God. So make sure that you confirm the word that God is speaking to you through the Bible and ask also ask trusted older mentors in the body of Christ to, to help you with that. I'm so thankful that I did that. Number two, don't use your word from God to manipulate others. Don't use your word from God. I, here, here's the classic one, a guy going up to a girl and saying, hey, baby, God told me I'm going to marry you. I, what, what can she say to that? I guess she could just say, I don't think we serve the same God. Because <laughs> I'm definitely not hearing that. <laughs> uh, that. That is totally manipulative. Don't make someone have to one-up you with, with their word. You go up to someone, well, God told me to tell you to give me $1,000. No. The, in the same way we want to be people that receive the word of God, we need to be people that have the character of God. And... 1 Corinthians 13 says this, that love seeks not his own. So if you're using your word to just gain things for yourself instead of preferring others, then you are manipulating the word of God. So don't manipulate others with your word. Number three, don't be prideful with your words from the Lord. 
That, that's the exact opposite of the model of Jesus. I mean, he had the greatest words that he'd be the savior of the world, and yet he humbled himself and became a servant. I find that sometimes people wear the words of God that they receive like a, a letterman jacket with, with letters on it or badges, and they, they wear it like a big badge honor. Well, I'm the person who received this word from the Lord. And they, they tell all the things that God's told them that they're going to do, and then you look at their life, and there's no fruit from it. No so many of the words you receive, actually, they're just between you and the Lord. Do you know, like, uh, your, your best friend, the, the friends you're closest to, or, or, or your spouse, with, with those people, you actually have secrets that are known just to you. Do you know that every word you get from the Lord, you're not supposed to go blab into others? There's things that the Lord's told me that I don't tell other people. Why? Because they're precious to me from the Lord. Don't use your word as a badge of honor to make yourself look good, to impress other people. You're responding in the exact opposite spirit of Jesus, who humbled himself and and considered uh, equality with God nothing to be grasped, but instead became a servant. That is what we want to be. And the more we do that, the more I believe God will actually entrust you with his words. And number four, don't go it alone. Don't Go it alone. As we look at the Bible, when God gave people words, it actually drew community to help them. Paul, probably the person that was hearing God most clearly in the New Testament, God gives him a Macedonian call. And look at what happens. He doesn't go off by himself. He gathers a team and goes with them. God is always gathering people. Adam, man, he had a relationship. He was the only man on earth. And God said, no, it's not just me and you, Adam. I'm giving you a wife, and you're going to have a family. God is the God who is constant creating family, creating community, creating church. And so when you get a word from the Lord, it's actually going to build community, not pull you out of it. So don't go it alone. Let's finish with this. Let's finish with this. Let's look at the words of Mary, how she responds When the angel says, nothing shall be impossible with God. Or better, he says, for no rhema word is without power to fulfill the will of God. She says this, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant. May your word, may your rhema to me be fulfilled. Yeah, I talk about this often, but I I coached for many years. I coached soccer teams. I coached football teams. I coached basketball. You know that the the, the player that I would give the word to, the player when the game was on the line that I would give the instructions to, you know who they were? They weren't the ones who wanted to go do their own thing. They were the one who said, coach, just tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you tell me. They were the ones that I knew would listen and obey. You know, if you want a word from the Lord, then the right posture is to come up and say, I'm your servant. You're not coming up and saying, oh God, I really love Johnny. Can I marry Johnny? Oh God, I really love Sally. Can I just marry her? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? Okay, I think you said yes. No, you come and say, Lord, I am your servant. Whatever you want. Lord, I love what one friend says. Lord, I want to be like change in your pocket. Spend me however you want. I am your servant, Lord. Your servant is listening, and then you receive a word, and you say, may your rhema to me, Lord, be fulfilled. Let's stand up.